Hello, everybody. So I've learned my lesson here to keep the camera on auto for shutter speed and ISO. At nighttime, I put the shutter speed up so that it doesn't go below the f double the frame rate. But during the day, I had the suspicion because at nighttime it was lowering the shutter speed to 120 or 130 when I had it set to 30 frames a second, that it would lower it too much. But then when I actually took the camera off of my helmet, what I noticed is that when it's off my helmet, it's up to like 1, 240, 1, 1360 during the day, so it isn't lowering it too much during the day. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the stuff here is like, I want to see what you see, but I can't, I have to take the camera off of my helmet in order to do that. So I, I think I'm just, during the day, the, I think the video stabilization that the camera is doing is as good as it's going to get without mounting like a Sony AX53 on my head, which is probably a really stupid thing to do. It has a gimbal built in, but it's still like a nice gimbal built into the sensor, but that, that's not, that camera's not designed for being on top of a helmet. The, the little screw mount on the bottom of it constantly breaks just from a tripod. I can only imagine that thing falling off of my head when I'm going 30 miles an hour and smacking into somebody. That's not, that's not a good thing. So. I, what I think I need to do is I need to move my head less or move my head in a more stable manner. It's difficult to have a bit of a head tick, but we'll see. So Dan did his first board repair video yesterday and I am very happy at how it came out. And apparently so are a lot of you. I was very happy to see that he did a, a good job there. Hey, you're not allowed to go between the cars. That's my job. Anyway. He did a really good repair job on the, you know, the, he diagnosed everything correctly. He did the repair live without screwing up. I will admit his thermal paste thing, he has to have been fucking memeing me on the thermal paste. We all watched, the, like, Steve was in the chat when he did the thermal paste and said, we did not teach him this. We take no, I, this is not us. I do not take credit for this. Yeah, we, we, we took that off and fixed that part. Like, you don't have to put thermal paste outside the dye. <laughs> oh, that was uh, that was funny. But yeah, one of the things I like about this field a lot is that you don't need to have a college degree or go to some fancy schmancy technical school to do s to learn how to do something that'll make you more money than just working at Whole Foods or Walmart. You know, it's like there are very few trades still left that don't have a high barrier to entry. I mean, he started here as the shipping guy. And he got so, I don't know if you saw that, but the car next to me had its mirror knocked off and wires sticking out. Also, for those wondering why I don't ride in the bike lane, as you can see, the bike lane is actually a parking spot. And that's a New York City Department of Buildings do there. Oh my God. So, you know how the New York City uh, was screwing with me? You know how they, they, find, they wanted to fine me up to $15,000 for disobeying a law that they didn't know? Well, this guy with this license plate, AX9054, is a New York City city car that's fucking parked in the bike lane. But do you think he's going to get a fine? Of course not. Anyway. Oh, my God. That's triggering. That is so triggering. But I was very proud of what he did. You know, he, he started here as a shipping person, and that job is boring as hell. So every job there is at this company, I have done. At some point in time, when it was smaller, or when other people were out, I've done it for longer periods. I used to do all the shipping myself. Then uh, Veniera, the receptionist, was doing it for us. She kind of just became the person that did all the jobs none of us wanted to. Uh, then we had a few shipping people. Dan wound up being just consummate professional at it. Didn't screw things up detail-oriented. If something came in and he thought something was funny about it, he would bring it up with us rather than waiting for it to become a problem later. Really good guy. And he got bored of this. And one day I just saw him sitting with Chris and Camille asking questions and trying stuff out at the end of his day. And he asked me, you know, can I go on a... I, I think he took me to the do you, do you want to be a board repair person? Do you want to work towards it? And he said, sure. 
So we spend a little bit of extra time every day, you know, an hour or two, just talking to them, watching what they're doing, overlooking it. And this, one of the things I find interesting about this business is you really can't tell who's going to be good at it. Like, I've had people that had degrees in electronics come by and previous jobs working in design or electronics engineering kind of stuff, and they sucked. Like, they had no diagnostic mindset. They didn't have a detective's mindset. They could never figure out the problems. They couldn't even get themselves in a mindset where they could make good guesses. I couldn't get them to figure out how to solder stuff properly, even after months and months. Most of what you see on my wiki at repair.wiki, by the way, shout out to the Open Repair Discord. I'll include a link down below. These people have been cleaning up this wiki and making it amazing. And thank you so much to every single one of you who added information to it that may help someone do a repair. That wiki is not just for me to put stuff in. It's also for any of you to put stuff in. And the thing that was really... All those, uh, I, all those entries I have on being able to tell physical f issues or how to tell when this, is, this component is damaged or liquid damage, almost all of those are from my auditing process for new employees. So we have an auditing, an onboarding process. If you're a new board repair technician, before your work goes out to the customer, I want to look at it. And almost everything you see there where I said, this via is broken and destroyed. Whoa. Okay, this is, this is serious bullshit. Like, what, what the fuck? What, what? Why does everyone keep parking in the goddamn bike lane? Like, this is so effing annoying. Oh my god. So, yeah, every single one of those examples came from someone who brought it to me and said, Lewis, this repair is done. And then I look at it and it's like, no, no, it's not. No, it's not. So, see this and this and this and this and this. And I, how do you teach people to see that shit? I don't know. You know, I, so I made that, that page in the repair wiki because I figured, you know, if this is an issue, if this is a challenge to me being able to get staff that know what they're doing, then surely this is stuff that your average individual who's just learning this on their own is going to have a difficulty with. So I'm going to include it in my wiki. I'm going to include it in my manual. Just finding people who could see that. You know, you could find someone who has a bachelor's in electronics engineering, but they could still just be blind. Or you could find someone that has 2013 vision on their, you know, on their eye exam who cannot see to save their life that there's giant corrosion on this. So what I've, it's really, like, the, the people that wind up being good at this are often the people that you would never expect to be good at it. It's why, you know, having a, it's why it's difficult a position to hire for. But it's really cool when the people that you wouldn't expect, you know, <clears throat> like guy with a high school education who worked in shipping, just stays an extra half an hour to an hour every day, motivated by the sheer intense boredom of that job, and figures it all out. And my God, is shipping boring here. I mean, it, it, it's boring. It's, it's, it's absolutely monotonous. You know, you, you get a list of tickets in Shiprush, now Ship Station, and, you know, it says this machine is in this slot. Uh, send it out. You click the button. The label comes out. It tells you which slot it's in. You 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 open it. You make sure it turns on, because even even though the machines get tested, uh, you know there's still the opportunity for it to die in the slot. God knows that much if you've worked here for longer than two weeks. You turn it on. Make sure it works. Uh, you know, use a little bit of UVX and a microfiber cloth to clean it off to make sure that just in case someone here missed cleaning it, it's clean. You put it in a box. Bubble wrap it. You put that box in another box. You put the shipping label on it. Uh, it closes out the ticket and you put it in the pile and you just literally do that all day long. And then when machines come in, you read the, the sheet that says, you know, that from the, uh, that says uh, what, what the ticket number is. You find it, you enter it, you put it in a slot, you clean it off, you, bail, you, know, you cut up the box into little pieces, you put it into a cardboard recycling. It's, it's repetitive, it's monotonous, and it's brain dead. You know, one of the reasons that it always pissed me off and when they said you're not allowed to wear headphones while doing work, I hated that crap. I would always break that rule. And I encourage people here to, to like, by all means, listen to music while you work if you want or a podcast or something. Because I, I, did his, I did his job just recently last year for a month and a half from March and April when COVID hit. Because there were people that just, you know, that they wanted to stay home in case, uh, you know, in case COVID actually wound up being one-tenth as bad as the news advertised it as being, you know. I remember that when they were talking about a potential 3% mortality rate. Oh, my God. That was a, my God. Hindsight being 2020.
LOL. Anyway, so he, you know, he stayed home, and uh, I did that job, and I was reminded, again, just how much it sucks. It's incredibly, incredibly boring and brain dead and repetitive, and it has no like real reward. It's just grueling and boring. I mean, somebody's got to do it. The machine's got to go out. You know, people got to get their stuff back, but shipping is fucking boring as hell. So I would, you know, I'd have Joe Rogan podcast playing or something else playing throughout the day, but you know, so that I, I could at least retain some of my sanity. Because if you have a job where you're just doing blo shipping all day, and they tell you you're not allowed to listen to a podcast while you go, it'll find you a new job. If they say that it hurts productivity, no, it doesn't. I run a business in one of the most expensive cities in the in the U.S. Wearing headphones, there's no correlation between someone wearing headphones and decreased productivity. I've never had that experience. I don't think anybody, it, it, no, just, if you have to do the same shit over and over again, you need the ability to listen to something that keeps you from losing your mind, because once you lose your mind, you'll actually start making mistakes. So you, you need to have your, and uh, he was losing his mind with it, which is completely understandable because it's boring as hell, so he decided to, that was his motivation. His motivation was, if I don't learn this... Hi. I don't know why that person was staring at me. But mm, I guess because I'm talking to myself, and that's probably kind of weird. And I have this strange DPA 4065 microphone with a giant piece of packing foam and some twist ties around it. So, and I'm using the twist ties and the foam as a pop filter. So it probably looks really weird. But it sounds really good, so I don't care if it looks really weird. That's how I'm able to use this and have... There's a lot of wind right now, and I was going pretty fast before, and you probably couldn't hear any of that wind because of the setup. Anyway. But that, that's a, it's a good motivation. You know, if I figure this out, I don't have to do that boring-ass shipping job anymore. And he figured it out, and when he figured it out, we found someone else to do that boring-ass shipping job. It's also, you know, one of the interesting things is that actually sometimes, uh, I'm going to try to say this without sounding condescending, but it's going to come off as condescending anyway. Like, this is the kind of stuff you're not supposed to say, but when it comes to those types of brain-dead jobs, it's actually, you're actually better off hiring someone who is less intelligent because they'll do a better job. Uh, if you hire someone who's really, really smart and you give them a job that's highly repetitive and aggravating, like, I mean, it's highly, just highly repetitive and brain-dead, they, their mind is going to start to wander, they're going to start to lose it, and eventually they will start to do a really bad job of it. Like, let's say you have just a bunch of keyboard replacements, right? Like H1278 keyboard replacements all day long versus board repair. If you would think that, well, a board repair technician is more skilled than just a reassembly technician, so they would do a better job of it. Wrong. If you find someone who is not particularly the smartest individual, you know, simple brain, simple thoughts, simple life, you could give them the simple work to do, and I'm, I'm not saying that they're going to love it, but they'll be able to grind through that work over and over and over again, and they'll do it with a pretty good degree of success. Whereas you give someone that's actually really good at you know, diagnostics and uh, open-ended troubleshooting and all that stuff, you give that person, if you give that person the highly repetitive task to do, they'll start to lose their minds, and then you start seeing the corners get cut. So I've had people that were actually very smart, very capable, usually the ones that figured out the repairs for everybody else, but I couldn't give them the jobs to do repeatedly because they were so aggravated out of their mind and bored at the monotonous and repetitiveness of the work and the lack of brain turning on. They would, they, they would take shortcuts or, or just do things that didn't make sense and start making really silly, stupid mistakes. So... That is loud. That is one loud train. But like stuff like that, those are the success stories. I don't want to butter them up too much, but you know. The guy with no electronics knowledge that started as a shipping clerk sits next to Chris and Camille, applies himself as much as he can. And a few, you know, a month or two later, is good enough that I could give him like the recycled machines in the store, and he can mess with those. And then a few months after that, you could give him customer devices to work on.
It reminds me of that story I always tell that the guy that worked at the pizzeria that started his own company buying recycled stuff from companies and then reselling it. Are we doing repairs for those types of businesses? You know, he took a three-day course. He's really good at board repair. And yeah, you, know, you don't have to be this like 180 IQ genius or you know master's degree in college to do this stuff. You just kind of have to have the the desire, uh, an, uh, a curiosity, incentive. Yeah. A detective's mindset. Pattern recognition's another one. Pattern recognition's a big one. The people who recognize patterns do very well. We're going to probably do more of these. I'm going to, I want to set up my office streaming setup so that other people can do these videos more often than, than I do them. So now maybe you get Paul, Camille, Dan. David was a, maybe David. David really doesn't want to do streaming, but he picks on everybody else here. So I'm thinking he should be the first one that has to do streaming. Whoa, are they riding in boats? No way. No way. I want a boat. They have speed boats. They have speed boats. Oh, I want to ride in the water. I am so jealous right now. Do I need a license or registration for that, or is there a way I can cheat like Bafang? I hope there's a way I could. Oh, that looks like so much fun. The only problem is getting that Hudson River water on you while you're going around. Or East River, not Hudson. Hudson's the other side. I'm being a noob. That would be fun. But once you get off the boat, then I'd have to figure out a way to get to work from there. Unless I could have a way to make the boat... I could put my bike on the boat. That's actually not a bad idea. Get a boat that could fit my bike on it. But that would probably increase the amount of time it took to get to work. However, I think it would be 10 times more fun. All right, note to self for the, next for, for the next moment of time I have free. Figure out how to get one of those boats. There's a train to my left. I can't really race the train on this bike. The uh, chain, cassette, and derailleur are all a little messed up. I haven't put time into maintaining it. Whoa. Yeah. That's the way to wear a mask.
Uh, dangling on one ear. I don't particularly care if you don't wear a mask outside. It's just strange to me when you see the mask compliance is done via having people wear them under their chin or oh, under their nose, all oh, that ridiculous. I get my second dose of the vaccine on the 28th. One week after I've had that vaccine, the chances of me getting or spreading COVID go down incrementally. What I'm thinking is one month after I've gotten it, because I waited a really long time to get it, at that point, I, I, uh, I cease to care. Because I, I know that even if I got it, there's a small chance that I can spread it, and that small chance of me getting and spreading it uh, would then be a, a small chance of someone else getting it and then get, having to deal with COVID. I got, now, I got my vaccine later than a lot of people because I was not checking the website every day to figure out if I'm eligible. You know, you're only eligible for the vaccine in the beginning if you were in a certain specific group. Like, do you have this uh, pre-existing condition? Are you this race? That kind of blah, blah. So I, just, I, like, I wasn't keeping up with it because I didn't care. I didn't care enough about it. You know, like five people in my age bracket... Five people in my demographic got COVID and died in New York City. So, you know, like this wasn't like, and also in the beginning, in order to get the vaccine, it was, you know, like a two or 300 mile trip. But, and I waited a fair amount of time. Now, of other people, I'm, I'm giving it a month. So once I've had the vaccine, and then another month has passed after that for the people that really, you know, procrastinated and put it off or who are busy with work or whatever and couldn't get the time to walk over for 10 minutes. At that point, I believe everybody that will have wanted the vaccine who want, will have had a chance to get it. So at that point, the only people that are going to be left are the people that think that the vaccine gives you 5G or cancer or makes you sterile or people that just don't think that COVID is fake. And at that point, I don't really care if I, you know, if, 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 they, if I give those people COVID. Because at that point, that's kind of a, you know, like that, that was their choice. So about a month after I get my vaccine will be the point at which I completely stop caring about whether I am in a room with someone without a mask on, whether I'm in a store with someone without a mask on or any of that. Because right now I'm, I, I mask indoors, I mask around people, I have avoided uh, settings where I'm around large numbers of other people. I, I've complete, I mean, that, that's a pretty easy thing for me to do because I don't get along with people to begin with and I don't really go go out and I don't go out and party or anything like that so the circumstances where I'm in rooms with lo lots of people are like once or twice a year anyway but I've gone out of my way to avoid that kind of stuff I'm setting my date one month after I get the vaccine at that point everybody who will have wanted a vaccine should have gotten both of their doses so if I do get you know fit into that like five or ten percent of people that got the vaccine and still got COVID and then I wind up giving it to somebody else uh, at that point, they had all the opportunity to get the vaccine so that getting COVID would not be a horrible experience for them. And I'm just, I'm done. So I set myself at like, Ju I don't know, like probably mid-late June. Yeah, like mid-late June is when I stopped giving a shit about all this. I heard, I've heard people say, well, what if, so what if even if you get the vaccine, you should still have the mask on even weeks later because of others that didn't get it. And I... I I understand that to some extent, but once everybody who, like, the vaccine's already free, it takes like two or five minutes to get it. It's pretty easy. It's not like it was before where you have to jump through all these fucking hoops and prove that you're in a specific group or you have certain pre existing conditions to get it. I don't even know, yeah, it's not like I want people to die or get sick or anything, but at that point, I've done everything I can to, uh, and I'm not going to limit my life at that point for people that chose to not get something that's made available for free in virtually every drugstore across America. That point. Is I feel bad if you get it. You know, I'll still say I hope you get better. You know, pat you on the back. But... I heard one person on YouTube, I forget the name, say that they're still wearing a mask even though they got vaccinated uh, when they're going out because the, the physical appearance of it 
makes people think that the pandemic is still an issue and it reinforces that this is still a public health issue. Uh, it makes people believe that they should not, you know, let their guard down just yet and all that. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wearing a mask because of how, other, of how, you know, the message I want to send to people. I'm wearing it because it stops me, if I have it, from potentially giving it to you. It doesn't stop it. it you know, it's a chance. As they like, you know, mass, they're not going to stop, completely stop the spread of something like this, especially this cloth shit. It lowers the possibility, it lowers the likelihood. So it's my way of being courteous to you, because I know it doesn't help me not get it, it just helps me not spread it to you. If, you know, I, I, I talk and I spit while I talk, or I'm breathing heavily or some shit, or I sneeze. But once I've gotten a vaccine, the chances of me doing anything to you are stupid low. And once I have a vaccine, and you've had a chance to have a vaccine for a month, then the chances are even insanely lower. And the only thing that would increase those chances for you to have a bad time would be if you chose not to get it. In which case, you know, I respect your personal choice. I respect your personal choice. I will not belittle you for it. I will not condescend you for it. I will not give a fuck, uh, you know, to, for, about you entering my store, or entering my business, going out with you or anything like that. I just can't bring myself to change anything about how I live my life at that point. I thought that was really strange because like, I've heard people say that there are people who lean more left than I do that would, w that would wear it because they didn't want to, quote, seem Republican or they didn't want to seem like someone who, who they didn't want to seem like an anti-masker. And it's like, I just, th that, that's so high school. That is so complete, utterly high school. Like, I'm, I'm not wearing this because I care what people think of me, or I'm not sending a, wearing it because I care about sending a message. Just, you know, I'm going to keep my business open. You know, Cuomo and de Blasio could gargle my balls on that, on that, on that pause order because they're sure as fuck not, you know, paying my staff <laughs> or paying my bills or helping me, you know, save for retirement. So fuck out of here with that. I'll keep my business open, but I'm going to wear this because if there's any, you know, something that costs virtually no money that will helps prevent the spread of something, and the data shows that it does, I will do that to be courteous. And I'll do it because it makes sense to not sp spread shit before we know how bad it is. But I ain't wearing it because of the, the message it sends or anything like that. Like, out of, F out of here. I have no COVID friends. I really don't. I have zero COVID friends. To my more New York liberal people, I am, a, I am an evil, cold-hearted capitalist who cares more about money than human life because I did not go bankrupt for the sake of something that killed five people in my age group. And uh, here. And for, to my more conservative friends, I am a COVID cuck because I wear a mask. The mark of the beast. So stupid. I'm not gonna wear or not wear something because of how it makes me look or my political affiliation, or how it makes someone else feel, or the message that it sends, or the political side that it, se that it sends a message that I identify with, or that wearing it means you're on the side of the people that want your business to get destroyed, and not wearing it puts you on the side of the crazy anti-science people. Like, I'm just, I'm not. Like, ah. Oh. Watching that unfold really brought to light how things happen. Like, did South Korea or Japan have a culture war over masks? Like, they didn't. They wore them above their nose on, like, 90% of fucking America. They just, like, they just dealt with it. Their death rates are so low, it's insane. Hell, their case rate is so low, it's insane. Like, one of the things that I learned from this entire experience is how, like... <laughs> Cultural wars are such a gigantic waste of resources and time and human potential for the, for the ability to problem solve. I mean, I, people need narratives 
They need something, you know, they, they need to feel like they are a part of something. They need to have a tribe. And people have beliefs that differ from other people's beliefs and that the way that that is manifested in a society where how certain people believe can overlap into policy that affects your life. I get where cultural wars come from, but I mean, at the same time where I understand where they come from, they're, they're such a fucking waste of time. I'm going to wear this because it sends a certain message. I'm not going to wear this because it sends a certain message. Who the fuck cares about the message? Don't care about the message. I care about the reality. That's me, by the way. That's my reflection. Is that not a handsome reflection or what? It's a handsome reflection if I say so myself. Is that a new Instagram like position or something? The squat? Squatting and sipping from a cup. <laughs> That's a new Instagram pose for me. I've never seen that one before. I'm gonna get someone to take a picture of me squatting with a cup. Maybe I'll understand it when I see it in context of the advertisement. Every time I see those Tesla wheels, it triggers me because those are the wheels that cost an additional $2,000. Not only do those wheels cost $2,000 more than the stock wheel, $1,500 or $2,000, I forget, I think it's $2,000, but they're also actually less efficient. So if you get those wheels, uh, you, your car actually gets less mileage per watt hour, which is insane to me. Less mileage per watt hour And it costs more money. It's the ultimate sign of consumerism there. Because I think the consumer is doing is they're looking at it and saying, this costs more money, therefore it must be more better. The more money must mean more better. So they're going to pay the more money for the more better, but they, without doing the Google search to figure out that the thing that costs more money actually performs worse. Worse. Makes the car less aerodynamic then I think that costs $1,500 to $2,000 less. It's just intensely triggering. Every single time I see that car with those wheels, that's the mark that somebody paid $2,000 extra to get something that actually hurts the performance and the efficiency of the car. Like I would get if it was the other way around, if the aero wheel cost more money. Get more mileage, increase your efficiency. I don't know if that efficiency is going to be worth 2,000 bucks, but whatever, I get it. But you decrease the efficiency of the car for $2,000. Holy shit. I got to start doing that on repairs. Like maybe ultrasonically cleaning the motherboard will be stock, and it'll be an additional $100 to... Avoid Branson flu. Uh, let's see. How would I call it so it sounds like an upgrade? What if I called the de-stress computer additional hundred dollars? And if, if for that additional hundred dollars, instead of running the stress test that we usually run before sending out a repair, that we would not set, do the stress test before sending out the repair. So we would, your computer would technically be less stressed because we wouldn't be running a stress test on it. It would save me time and money because I wouldn't have to pay someone to do the stress test and I could get more from the customer. That could be the Tesla model. I gotta give, it, give Elon Musk something. He's a good fucking salesman. Way better salesman than I am. Like he earned that money, he really did. I'll give Elon Musk that. He earned that money. Last year, people were like, what do you think of your stock price? It's like, I don't know. I think it's kind of overvalued in my opinion. It's a little, stock price is a little high. 
Yeah, this, I mean, yeah, this, this company that this company I run that I am, you know, primarily compensated in stock. Yeah, the, you know, the thing that comprises most of my net worth. I think that's way too much money. It should be worth less. Not only does his stock wind up going up as a result of saying it, but he was honest. If you look at the P/E ratio, he didn't avoid the question or say, "Well, you, you don't understand. Tesla is not just a car company. We are an alternative energy company, a battery company, or this company. We're changing the world. We're worth." Oh, he just look. He just straight up tweet. You know. Yeah, it seems like this company is overvalued. <laughs> this is overvalued. And people lost their shit. But after he said it, the, the value of the company went up. He, that's fucking salesmanship right there. Like, salesmanship is not when you convince someone to spend a bunch of money on something by coming up with the exact things to say that, twi that you know, p poke their buttons. Salesmanship is when you're like, don't buy my product. My product costs too much money. You don't want this thing. Yeah, you know, these wheels, these wheels are actually going to lower the efficiency of the product. But an additional $2,000. And people buy it anyway. My stock is overvalued. My stock price is, is too high. And people buy it anyway. That's salesmanship. It's quality salesmanship. Similar to Mr. Clinton's quality content. Mr. Clinton with the quality content. See, those are the good wheels. Those are the wheels that, that those wheels mean that person did not give Elon Musk two thousand dollars for a useless upgrade. Quote upgrade. When I see those, that person's a financially responsible Tesla owner. I would wonder if there's a correlation between people who lease and people who buy the car. Or people who at least finance at least they buy it instead of leasing it. Is there a correlation between people leasing the car and people buying the car between the people that choose to get the useless expensive wheels that don't that fuck up your range and the people who get the aero wheels like I'd be curious if there's any research on that I want to study that I have more important things to do with my life but I still want to study that There's a lot of people out again. I'm kind of wondering what the offices are like. <laughs> For me, key to this being a successful business again will be, at least a, a business that is viable in this location, will be what happens to office business in schools. If the offices in the area reopen and people actually show back up to them, there will be a client base for years to come. If they don't, then we're out of here. I'm very curious to see how that turns out. New store. Well, I will see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.